Hey, thanks for checking out the Nikhil Hogan Show. If you like the content, you can subscribe to it on most major podcast platforms, YouTube or Facebook. I'm also writing a book on music education called Why Children Quit Music. And you can check out my website, NikhilHogan.com, for updates on when it's going to be released. If you're a parent who's interested in learning how best to help your children learn music, you can check out my company, SongbirdMusicAcademy.com. And there are a ton of free articles links and resources for Neapolitan Partimento-based learning, and also the Barry Harris Method if you're interested in learning jazz. Now, let's get to the show. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Nikhil Hogan Show, the show bringing you in-depth music conversations with the best musicians in the world. I'm so happy to introduce my guest today, concert pianist, researcher, and teacher, Professor David Dolan. In his solo and chamber music performances, he incorporates improvisation into the relevant concert repertoire and repeats cadenzas, as well as in preludes, fantasias, and improvises on themes provided by the audience. In addition to performing worldwide, he is the professor of classical improvisation and its various applications to solo and ensemble performance at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama in London. David has been heading the Center for Creative Performance in Classical Improvisation since 2005. He also teaches at the Yehudi Menuhin School. Since 2011, David is running a program of classical improvisation applied to performance at the Australian National Academy of Music in Melbourne based on annual intensive residencies. Hey, David, so great to be able to talk to you today. Same here. Thank you. Well, before we begin, could you tell me about your musical background? When did you start to play the piano? I guess it was about six, five or six. My, my, I know that my father's mother told him, you give this boy a year of trial, and then if I was wrong, just forget about it. But I would like him to have a go. I don't know why. And, well, that's how it started. Is that when you started lessons, or is, did you pl- mess around before that? Messing around, a lot of it. I guess improvising started then because luckily I, I started with the joy of not, uh, you know, having to sight read first. And, and I think that that really is a part of my luck because it was Im- immediately connected with pleasure. And I started taking lessons, I think, six, eight months later in, yeah, in, in Israel, in Haifa, which is where I was born and spent the first part of my life. And what were you improvising? What kind of music was in the house at the time? A lot of classical music. My parents were both in their youth playing. My mother played the piano and my father the violin, and they listened to a lot of music. So that that was a natural part, like, you know, drinking water. Well, did they improvise? Did they themselves? No. And because of what they went through during the war, which wasn't great fun, they couldn't play anymore. But they listen to music a lot. But when when I arrived to this world, they were no longer playing. And so what happened with your first teacher? Did he or she teach you to sight read and learn to read music, classical music and proper technique and that sort of thing? Yes, she did. Or to be fair, she tried. <laughs> I, I realized that I prefer the joy of working by the ear I guess all that was not at all conscious, much more than the burden of having to learn how to read notes. And I I managed for some time, I guess the right word is to cheat, because (laughs) I know that sometime in the late second year, I know that my teacher then caught me not turning page at the right place. And then she found that I hardly read notes. nothing to do with the level of the piece she gave me at the time, Bach invention, uh, which I heard the other kids playing and and quoted by ear and more or less thought that I knew where to turn the page, but I got it wrong. That was quite a big scandal. And then she put me on a much more disciplined diet of proper reading notes. Well, David, do you have absolute or perfect pitch? That's an interesting question and a funny answer. Depends on the day. Sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. I know it's very funny. I <laughs> don't know how how it comes and how it goes, but yeah, that's the answer. 
Okay, so with the discipline of the sight reading, did you still maintain the side improvisationary kind of uh, uh, style to your playing? Yes, and for many years, as a, just as a way of you know nourishing the joy. I didn't do anything systematic about it. My teacher didn't encourage it in a systematic way because she was brought up in the traditional classical way, but she didn't discourage it, for which I am very grateful. And it wasn't until I, I actually entered the academy, the music academy in Israel, when I met a giant musician, a composer and pianist and harpsichordist and great improviser. He was originally called, when he lived in Germany, Heinz Alexander, and when he immigrated to Israel, he changed his name to Haim Alexander, and he was the first to put me on a more systematic approach of developing improvisation. Right. Let me let, let me jump in here, uh, David. Let me ask you this. So, so I get the sense that you were playing and listening to a lot of classical music. In Israel, did you listen to traditional Israeli music, Arabic music, just being part of that region? Very good question. Not during my childhood, very, very much so. Later, a great colleague and friend is the virtuoso oud, Arabic oud player, Taizir Ilyas, with whom we eventually began to perform duo concerts, Oud and Cano. So the hugely rich uh, music language of the Arabic classical music, which is mainly based on improvisation, although the theory of it is very, very complex. But Arabic virtuoso players are extremely knowledgeable and extremely capable of just forgetting about the you know, strictness of the rules and moving between dozens of, you know, mak makamat. Right. The, well, I want to get into the Arabic music and uh, that in, in, in a minute. One final question for your childhood is, for the classical music, what do you remember that your diet, What was it Baroque music, uh, classical or romantic music? What was the music that you, you were predominantly playing? Well, my parents, I guess, were mainly putting romantic music from Schubert onwards, and I heard the, the you know great concerti, Tchaikovsky, and and and, and Beethoven, uh, etc. Uh, but I was so that was my childhood, I guess, more from my parents' side, more romantic music. But you know, Bach and and the classics were very quickly on the table as well. So I guess my childhood was mainly between uh, Bach or slightly before Bach, but not much, to late Romantic. Debussy was ultra modern, uh, so uh, during my childhood. Before you met Professor Haim Alexander, what did your teacher think of your improvisation? And generally speaking, growing up, did anybody talk to you? Did you have any conversations with other kids growing up about improvisation? Or were you really the only one? More or less the only one. My teacher thought that it, it's not harmful, so why not? Uh, she once even notated one of my improvisation, and she then told me that, you know, you must give it a title. <laughs> I didn't, so I said, how about the the Plant Symphony? <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, uh, it was more or less an entertaining phenomenon. It, it, it wasn't taken seriously by anyone, including myself. Let's talk now about meeting Professor Haim Alexander. Did he hear you improvise and make comments? Yes, he he was also my first composition and actually the, the only serious composition teacher. So at the same time, he worked with me on improvising and composing. That's when I started to study more seriously Conpoint, both the Fuchs Five Species, Gradus uh, Apanasum, etc., but also free Baroque free point, harmony, harmony, including voice leading, obviously. So it all came together under with the help of Haim Alexander. And he, he was wonderful in many ways, one of which was that he find the balance between 
systematic methodological approach of you know, making sure that I'm um, becoming more and more aware of these elements and letting me go by trial and error. So fusing the systematic and the the intuitive, actually, which remained, when I became more independent, one of my main uh, searches and passions, how to fuse uh, creative spontaneity with structural know-how, including the unconscious knowledge, which is something most musicians carry a lot of, and not, not always being aware of that. You mentioned the Fuchs counterpoint harmony. Did he use any particular textbooks or materials, or was it orally? Did he teach you by himself? Uh, what materials did he use? Well, we looked at the Grand Zeppelin itself, of course, but uh, he used his own way because he, he was one of those amazing teachers to go, as the French call it, à la tête du client, uh, to adopt it to, to the specific individual student. So exercises they gave me were according to how badly I did the previous week. And <laughs> you know, so it was really building it step by step. I want to ask specifically then. So let's take out just a random day where you would have met him. What would you bring to him and what would a typical lesson with him look like? I brought a minuet or a prelude that I composed based on uh, some instructions of him, whether a few bars he started or just a theme. And we went through it, you know, systematically about uh, where, where did he find either obvious uh, issues, parallel fifth, uh, God forbids, or, <laughs> you know, directions that was a bit too heavy for the flow forward. Um, then talking about stylistic elegance, as he called it, we looked into relevant examples from the repertoire, the master's repertoire. But then when we improvised, he did something that I later developed with my own students, which is sitting on two pianos and improvising together and, and swapping between leading and following, which is something I am very, uh, you know, keen to do with my own students. So we, we improvise together two piano, two hands, sorry, one of his, one of mine, three hands, and eventually four hands. By that I mean four and eventually even more voices with stylistic awareness. So um, when it came to Baroque uh, language, it, it was you know, specifically that language. When it was classical, the more symmetrical perioda uh, structure of phrases. Uh, when it was then more in the early romantic style, we, we went still more or less classically structured, but harmonically more you know, forward going and, and tensions resolving less less immediately, let's say. Well, can I let me jump in, David, and ask this question. Uh, theoretically, was he using pretty conventional university theory or was his idea of uh, theory a little bit different from the conventional harmony courses and counterpoint courses? No, he, he used what you may rightly call conventional uh, background. But as I said, he, he managed to do it very personalized, so, so to speak. Uh, he himself was a student of Hindemith's uh, student. So Hindemith was present in the room, but not uh, obsessively, I would say. And we also had a very, very fine ear training you know, course at the academy. So I was, is the ear training, is that uh, the solfege, is that fixed dough or movable dough? That was a fixed dough. So awareness of where you are when you modulate was always present. I only later came across the, you know, Kodai Empire yeah. <laughs> and movable dough world, which as long as you keep awareness of where you really are, has fantastic results, of course, provided that you remember where you are, that not everything is though once you modulated. And, but when done properly, it, it, of course, gives fantastic results. 
Can you just describe your training and your master's and your your PhD? Yeah, I became in that I owe to another giant lady who influenced me a lot, who is no longer with us, unfortunately, like I am Alexandra Dalia Cohen. My master's, I started to explore and PhD developed it furthermore, the idea of universal elements in emotional expression as you find them in heightened speech and in musical gestures. Uh, so we know about the effect layer, of course, but I was more interested in the presence of these gestures in improvised music. So my PhD was about parallels between uh, gestures of intonation when you express certain emotions and the same gestures I was hoping to find or I was searching in musical improvisations. And luckily I, I found, I was lucky to work with fantastic actors from four different cultures, uh, French, Arabic, English, and Hebrew Israeli. And I asked them all to, without any repeat, to express fear or anger or joy in both external and in, introvert versions over very silly phrases without any any depth of content. For example, the lamp is on the table or the, the barber shop is right across the road. But to say these phrases with very specific emotion. And then what we do, what we did was to look into the music of the speech while expressing these gestures. Then I asked the musicians to play a musical phrase expressing the same emotions. And then we analyzed it according to the melodical contour, the evolution of dynamic level, and how timbre evolves. Well, let me, let, David, let me ask a question. Let's say you there's an angry speech. Would you tie that to dissonance or loudness? How would you describe that? Good question. Well, the equivalent of dissonance, perhaps, if you wish, but uh, interestingly, extrovert anger would become in very many different cultures, very rhythmical, for example. So never mind what words you put in it. You can say, how could you do this to me? Uh, or uh, I don't want that at all. And there is a sharp fall, but really sharp, unlike a round end of phrase at the end, which is perhaps similar to a, a physical gesture that sometimes you see accompanying uh, an angry spoken gesture. Uh, the range of, of variation of pitch is very narrow. The level of height is above average, above normal unexcited speech. So you, you have quite specific musical characteristics of anger or of fear. Fear is the opposite. It's a very zigzag kind of contour of pitches. Um, the timbre is very unpredictable and changing and, and made of mainly high harmonics. In nostalgic, when, when you express nostalgy, like the opening of Tristan and Isolde will be a rising pitch contour with a diminuendo, which is very unnatural. Usually a crescendo and rising pitch will go hand in hand. That's fascinating. Let me ask this, David. So what year was this? Because this is very fascinating research. That, that when did I finish my PhD? My God. That was previous life, many, many years ago. <laughs> uh, to the 2000 and a bit, 2002, okay. three. Uh, I forgot. I'm sorry. Right, right. You know, you're um, doing some very high level uh, cognition almost in, 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 in this research. But you, w would it be fair to say that you are were very much alone in the classical world thinking of music this way, especially when it comes to improvisation? Did you have many peers that you could relate to in the... Uh, in the in academia or in, in the field of music that uh, in the classical field of music that you could talk to regarding improvisation 
Not then. There is, of course, uh, the, the wonderful, fantastic ally now and colleague. Uh, we, we collaborate a lot, Robert Levin. Uh, now, are you with, friends with Dr. Robert Levin as well? Very much so. He's the international chair of my center at the Guildhall. And he comes every year for a very, very you know, intensive residency of several days. And when you met him for the very first time, what was that like? Ah, oh, that was like, you know, new old friends. <laughs> we, met, we met in Harvard in, in, when was that? I think around, just before I finished my PhD, I think the early 2000s. And it took us three minutes to realize that we talk the same language and, and have similar passions. Is it very rare to meet another classical improvising musician? It is still rare, but thank God less so now. I think we are allowed to talk about a renaissance of classical improvisation. I hope I'm not expressing here wishful thinking, <laughs> but uh, there are some wonderful colleagues here in Europe, and there is a an amazing project in Europe called the Metric Project, which now has been running for the sixth year, where 15 leading European conservatoires are collaborating in reviving improvisation within the curricula of uh, higher education institutions, leading ones. Guildhall is, uh, of course, one of the leading ones. But there are others. That there, there, there is the... Uh, uh, Royal Conservatory of The Hague and, and the Paris Conservatory and, and qu quite a few. There are too many to, to mention now, but I think we're Very different to... from what it used to be. Exactly. I, I think we're allowed to say uh, that it's beginning to rebirth. I owe a lot of that to Yehudi Menuhin, of course, who is the reason why I live in, in the United Kingdom. He brought me out of Paris asking me to install this to, st to start this discipline in his school. In no the, kidding. So you, the reason that you're there is because of Yehudi Menuhin. Yes. He walked into a concert I gave in Paris in 2001, I think. And uh, it was in the... <laughs> I remember that very clearly. It was in the palace of the United Nations in Paris. They have a wonderful concert series and the music director then, Nicole Luc Marochal, just told me, oh, you know, I have a, a funny old man friend and he might come with me to the concert and we might have a drink afterwards. And she thankfully didn't tell me that her funny old friend was Yehudi Menuhin because <laughs> I might have got a bit nervous. <laughs> Yehudi came after the concert backstage asking me... What did, man, what did what? you play, uh, David, at that concert? Do you remember? Yes, I played with a wonderful French composer and pianist and improviser, Thierry Machuel, a two pianos concert where we played the Schubert Fantasy, of course, and Mozart, the two pianos and, and other works. But we also improvised in between. I improvised alone and we improvised together. I, I kind of led this concert. And I talked a little bit to the audience. I, I started to doing that much more later. But Yehudi came back and asked, basically, where do you think you can teach what you've just done? And I said, I hope so. And he said, well, what are you doing next Wednesday? And of course, I said, nothing. <laughs> absolutely free day. Said, Great, come to my school in London next week. <laughs> and he, he then sat with me for four four hours. He, he put in the room a string quartet and he said, if you are going to survive this quartet, we should talk. What did he mean by that, survive this quartet? He meant that this, you know, the Hugh Dumanian School is a very, very special place uh, with uh, 80 young people from the age of 9 to, 90, to 19. You know, it's a collection of some of the strongest talents in the world. What he meant is that they didn't improvise before. If you can make them improvise convincingly, if, if they are convinced, because Yehudi believe very much that the kids are the best, you know, uh, way to evaluate the quality of what they get, then then it becomes interesting. The, the kids started to improvise fantastically after 20 minutes. Well, what did you make them do? I, I'm not sure I remember exactly, but I remember vaguely that I started to suggest some musical conversations in classical style based on a 
let's call it a question phrase that I launched, ask, inviting them to answer, but without any time in between. So the, I call it ping pong in the sense that the ball is never on the floor, it's <laughs> always in the air between us. Right. And it started very simple, you know, just a short uh, call answered by a short response, but then it got more and more complex with two and three and eventually the whole quartet improvising what became a whole periodic sentence moving through modulation that I did to a second subject. And, you know, eventually you, you move on to ABA and rondos and... Wow. So wait a second. So you have been teaching classical improvisation since the 90s, right? 1990. So you were well ready to, to deal with any kind of ensemble situation. Uh, that was the hope. And, and luckily, Yehudi thought that indeed that was the case. So he asked me to, to start straight away. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm a great believer in working your improvisation both alone, of course, so that you establish and consolidate the vocabulary and how you put it together and how you put it in the flow of time, but also half of the work that my students are doing are with partner and eventually partners. And when I work with chemi music groups, it's the trio or the quartet or the quintet that is extemporizing between themselves each member of the ensemble is both leading and following, you know, different moments. So yes, ensemble work is, is a great part of it. If you have a group of kids, do you have set forms that you want them to improvise over? Or is it call and response, like you said? Because for instance, in the jazz world, everybody knows what a blues form is or rhythm changes. So in the classical world, is there some similar types of archetypical forms that you might use to get things going quickly? Yes, to start with, then according to, again, what I learned from Haim Alexander, I guess, according to how I feel the students are digesting the, the, the potion, I will take uh, the strictness of the form away, put in another one. So for, to begin with, we start with a periodic phrase structure, call and response. We then move to double periodic structure. And then we inject another voice. The base, of course, is the, you know, the base. Quick, uh, quick question. What is a periodic structure? A symmetrical a phrase that is built from, or you, you can think of it as a phrase that is enveloped under an arch, one arch, uh, starting with a, let's call it question, continuing by the answer, call and response. The symmetrical nature of the phrase answered by that you can take as as the opening element or, or cell of a periodic structure, symmetrical one, which which is one of the characteristics of the classical style versus the Baroque phrase structure, which is often not symmetrical. It's it's a Durchkomponier, and it's, it keeps moving forward through a double phrasing, where the end of one phrase is a note that is also beginning the next one, unlike the classical style. Well, uh, let me ask about the uh, call and response. What, let's say we're in the key of C, you use the Mozart piano sonata as an example. Uh, that response, how do you tell them what notes to choose? I don't. And there is a lot of trial and error. And if it's too clean, if there aren't enough wrong notes, I inject them in and their job is to take these wrong notes in. I'm not at all trying to go clean and polished, uh, the quicker the better, but to find your way through, you know, trial and error, including wrong notes, which are notes of tension that are eventually resolved. By wrong notes, are you referring to dissidences like seconds and fourths and sevenths and that sort of thing? Yes, and an appoggiatura, without which, you know, melodic life is pretty boring, appoggiatura, <laughs> that's the wrong note. It's a note outside the harmony going from usually above resolving going down. This is the more expressive note, which is why you would usually emphasize it and not the inverted comma correct note below. 
And this principle is even more important when you apply it in uh, harmonic progressions and improvising w- with uh, harmonic uh, dimension. What about the harmony underneath the melody? So in that sonata, I believe the bass goes four, three, two, one. Is that bass line fixed or do, would you come up with a bass line for them or ask them to make their own bass line to go with the melody? You now touch another element of the work, which is what I call harmonic reduction. Both solo players, imagine two cellists working on Bach on a company suite, although it's written for one on a solo cello, we work it with two and eventually three cellists where one is looking for the bass line that they, he or she is looking for through the harmonic Reduction and the harmonic reduction we look for through the harmonic rhythm, i.e., which harmony happens when and when does it change. And you represent the change by moving on to the note that through the correct voice leading will make sense going there with the right flow. And is this David connected to basso continuo in any way? Yes, it's it well, it's the basic logic behind the, the, the in, in a continuous situation the basso continuo is running the show as as i said yes it, it's the uh, you know life through time of moving forward to tension building up tension eventually resolving that the bass is governing yes and above that the the other voices of the harmonic progressions move around and the improvisation element is by varying it, moving to inner voices, moving uh, forwards and, and other voices supporting them and then exchanging that, but with an awareness of the bass all the time. So, mm. so is that how a string player can improvise, even though they, they can't play the bass, they have the bass in their ear and then they're improvising with that understanding of the bass that's going on at the same time? Exactly. So when they are on stage performing an unaccompanied cello suite, they have a secret weapon, which is in their inner ear, the bass line is there, supporting what they are doing, which which gives a lot of freedom to spontaneous changes of interpretation and of, of building on the upper voice, the, the text that Bach wrote, to, you know, spontaneous changes supported by the harmonic line underneath. So that means you can have multiple string players playing at the same time. If they all know the bass line, it'll just sound like a bunch of counterpoint happening at the same time, right? Exactly right. And eventually we move to three cellists or violinists when we are working on partitas or sonatas unaccompanied, well, where one will play the bass line, that they find through the harmonic reduction I mentioned. The other plays Bach texts. And the third one in between the two is improvising a counterpoint that goes according to the intentions of phrasing of the actual interpretation. And that person improvising in the middle will, you know, telepathize, so to speak, with the person playing the full text so that the final interpretation of phrasing comes from that inner voice improvised. Could you explain to me, for let's say a brand new student enrolled in Guildhall for classical improvisation, brand new, never improvised ever before, what would you make them do for the first year? What are their goals for that first year? And you can be, you can be technical. Well, my job number one, and the most important one, is not technical at all, is to bring down the walls of fear. Because, you know, students who were accepted to Guildhall and Juilliard and the Royal Academy and, and, and College, etc., and these kind of institutions are already quite serious players with quite a long history of disciplined work. And for not all of them, but many of them, the idea of improvising is synonym to looking for troubles. Most of us were raised with the idea that wrong notes are, you know, a disaster. The fear of <laughs> right. wrong notes. That's right. Yeah, the fear of wrong, wrong notes is governing us. So I am coming back to your question. The first job is to turn this business of classical improvisation into game playing. 
And before people are smiling and laughing and clearly having a good time, I don't start anything structured or technical. And that take, can take anything from 20 minutes to five, six weeks. You know, it depends. It depends. Okay, let's say the fear is gone. They buy into your system. They say, all right, Professor Dolan, I love it. What do you want me to memorize? What do you want me to learn? What do you want me to work on? Well, then we do in parallel uh, improvising. I usually start these ping pong exercises I mentioned before between two and eventually three players or two pianists and work on repertoire. So we do it with, you know, in parallel to work on repertoire so that the, the element of applying the improvisational state of mind, I will come back to it because it, it we can now say that such thing exists. We did a huge research project with Imperial College Neuroscience team. But let's come, go back to that together. To, to apply that when you work on your repertoire towards international competitions and towards, you know, concerts. So they will start with classical style. They will establish a theme and then a theme section. By that I mean... Once the statement of the theme is established, there will be an in internal development or a consolidation of it. And at a later moment, there will be a passage of modulation towards a second subject. So we are talking about a sonata form exposition, or uh, before that, we'll go to an ABA. And now we are talking also about real-time memorizing. So one, let's say that we are talking about uh, trio, a group of three people, one of the trio will lead the A section. The theme is established through these ping-pongs, uh, the A section is done, then another member of the trio will put in a theme of a contrasting character in a different key. It's, again, established and the proportions are more or less balanced. And then the person who improvised or started the first element of A has to remember what he or she has done and come back to it. And there is no time for analysis or notating, which means that they, and we are working on it, they uh, reconstruct or, or, or come back to, in their musical memory, to the structure to the harmonic structure and the motivic structure of the theme, not necessarily quoting every single note. And then again, you know, it's so it's A, B, A prime with a coda, and then, you know, later when I feel that the time is right, we move to rondo, A, B, A, C, A coda, then rondo sonata with an internal uh, elaborated passage. Later on, we move to uh, sonata form, once this uh, and is this, is this all ensemble or is this solo? Ensemble. I w I'm working with one ensemble throughout the year, and many people continue to a second year. But within that, we also work on solo development of every individual uh, for themselves. There are several, as you say, technical exercises. For example, singing and playing simultaneously to uh, at the beginning very simple bass and as we move along the bass becomes less and less simple and is this singing in solfege i am not insisting on that no okay. they don't have to sing the name of the note because i'm i'm more interested in them hearing the line moving forward in time okay so it's not a proper solfege a la française it's it's hearing in advance. It's actually a, an exercise of hearing the future. Some, some students call it Harry Pottering. <laughs> it's really to hear what comes next and then realize your uh, you know your imagination under the bass that you play at the same time yourself. This is an, an example of a work that is done individually but by one person. I need to ask you a different question now, which is somewhat related, is how do you distinguish between composition and improvisation? Good question. The, the work of composition has the luxury of going backwards. You can work on a passage and spend time on it, have a cup of coffee, come back and say, oh, no, no, that's rubbish, and, and delete, you know, two-thirds of it. Yeah. 
you can't do it when you improvise. When you extemporize, and it's a very good word, extemporize, because it's touching the element of time, you are connected. It's a Catholic marriage with real time, with a flow of real time, which composing doesn't necessarily uh, oblige you to. That's the main uh, difference, although, of course, there are common territories. Uh, yeah. Beethoven, as we know, improvised a lot of what he then later put in paper. Uh, his choral fantasy, when it came to the premiere, wasn't finished. The opening cadenza didn't exist, so he sat down and improvised it and later wrote it down. Uh, so, of course, there is there is an element, element of creating in both. Well, you mentioned Beethoven. Let's let's actually a good segue. What are some differences in improvisation in classical versus baroque versus romantic versus perhaps uh, late romantic 20th century? How do you what's like a quick way to distill each different era? A very good question and I'm afraid I don't have a quick way. <laughs> <laughs> we, but but because that involves a thorough learning of the characteristics of each language. The Baroque language is different than the classical language. And you know, we can talk about early classical and late classical. Late Beethoven, of course, is, is putting one foot and later more than one foot in the beyond classical language. His late sonatas are, are you know, melting down the strictness of the sonata form. And in romantic language, for example, the, the the element of leaving you, the listener, in constant long-term tension is uh, absolutely normal, which in classical style, less so. Uh, the, the strength of the dissonances used and the lack of earth under your feet in the sense that you know what what is the tonal center, what is the gravitation center from the tonal point of view, in late romantic uh, language, as we know, that isn't necessarily the case. In classical language, it is. Uh, Bach would never, to my knowledge, start a movement without absolutely clearly establishing the key of the movement, which uh, the late romantics not only don't bother, sometimes they enjoy cheating us. Think of Rachmaninoff second concerto, piano concerto, it starts with a glorious, amazingly beautiful cadence in F minor in order to launch the concerto in C minor. And, and Brahms, who is, you know, half modal, half tonal in the first piano concerto, brings you to believe that the piano will come in in G minor, ex except that, well, of course, it, it comes in, in, in D minor. So that's quite a lot of vocabulary then that you must internalize. Yes, that's right. And we do that, and that is, as you say rightly, involves a proper learning. But it then has to go to, to the background, to the you know, territory of unconscious knowledge, so that when you improvise, you access it on the flow. And sometimes you get it wrong, and you move on with the wrong note. Uh, uh, and dealing with wrong notes is, is a great part of the, you know, the work, the course. <laughs> right, right. And, and before people start to actually enjoy accidents, my job isn't done properly. Uh, I think it was Oscar Peterson, I hope I'm right, who said in a radio interview, he was asked, what do you do when you play a horribly wrong note? And he said immediately, without any thinking, I make sure I play it again twice, at least, straight away. <laughs> It's so a good way to cover. <laughs> yeah, it's no longer a wrong note. It's, it becomes yeah. a, a, a friend. And of course, not in a jazz language way, but it's it's similar. And do you, um, in Guildhall, or just in your philosophy, do you incorporate styles beyond classical? I know Arabic music is that we've mentioned earlier in the interview. Jazz, uh, other forms of improvisation that are common in other cultures. Is that, How do you, would you ask your students to look at these things? Uh, by making them aware, but very well aware of their existence. I am not an expert and I, I'm not speaking fluently the language of Arabic music. 
um, not even, unfortunately for me, fluent enough in jazz. So we create from time to time gatherings and, and projects with uh, Taisir Ilyas, I mentioned earlier, uh, our wonderful jazz department, where people just get together and, and have a, a melting pot jam session. By, by so the answer to your question is by really becoming familiar with, with with the presence of this music language. But uh, the course is really about classical improvisation. By classical, I don't mean period, classical period. I mean the Western art music from from pre baroque to actually post tonal. And here is the other part of answering your question. Yes, we do move beyond. Uh, tonality, we move to polymodality, so not the church modes, but the the way the 20th century dealt with modality. If you wish, the Debussy whole note harmony is pushing the modal element to, to the very end, where everything is whole tone. And also tonally free, completely tonally free, and there I take back the inspiration from the speech, from emotional speech, uh, the speech intonation. And as you know, I'm sure the Guildhall is also home for one of the best drama departments uh, in Europe. And we collaborate very closely with actors. And my students go through a very intensive whole term of working every week with actors. And the 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 common elements that actors use when they express what they are acting in their speech through emotional speech or the, the intonation being a musical material is the common ground for them to work with the musicians. Mm. Let me let me ask you this, uh, David. Uh, is is music, um, I, I understand as, as time has progressed, uh, harmony has changed from Baroque to the 19th century to the 20th century. Is it fair to say that it's just different? It's not just getting harder. It, like, for instance, is Bach not necessarily easier than Debussy? They're different and we have to look. How would you ask your students to look at music? Um, well, Bach is not easier than anything. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, when, when you come to, to Bach fugues, uh, the word easy isn't really very much at home here. <laughs> but, uh, and you know, from time to time, that really is quite uh, high altitude, but from time to time, you do have people who improvise fugues and, and trios and quartets who improvise fugues in, in quite, a fantastic way. But to go back to your question, no, I don't think it gets more difficult. Like for instance, yes. if like the, the harmonies of the 20th century Messiaen and that kind of thing. Oh, is that harder or is that just different? It's different and more complex. Yes. Uh, I think it's fair to say that Messiaen is a more complex business with the valeur ajoutée and the you know modes of the, the different rhythms and different adding uh, intervals, etc. Th th there is a greater surge of complexity in some parts of the later uh, periods than, for example, in the Stil Galant and the uh, early classical music. Yes, there is movement towards more, more challenges and more simultaneous challenges. Now, you've been teaching classical improvisation for a very long time. What are some common mistakes that students make when they're learning this craft? Good question. One common mistake at first is trying to be good, to <laughs> avoid, again, avoid wrong notes, to, you know, to be polite, which is a mistake. Uh, so I prefer a messy uh, dish. <laughs> on which we then work than something that is, you know, too clean, so to speak, which leads to another part of answering your very good question, falling into patterns. So something that uh, becomes simplistic or, or too safe again, I guess that once you improvise something and you found that you like it, it works, the tendency, maybe not always conscious, to keep repeating it is there. 
you know, old habits die hard, as, as they say. Mm. The problem is that old habits become old very young. <laughs> Almost once you did it for the second time and it worked, there is a tendency to to continue that. That's one of the reasons why I encourage people who work on improvisation to work with a partner or more than one partner, so that, you know, the chance that it will repeat itself is lower because you have to deal with some element of unknown coming from your partner. Another common mistake is trying to uh, consciously apply rules or calculate or analyze as you improvise, which means that you disconnect from the flow of real time. On the other hand, on the other extreme, you know, what the French call n'importe quoi, anything goes, <laughs> is, of course, a horror. It's, it's, it's a very dangerous trap. And, and it's the balance between the two. It's a balance between keeping the flow, keeping spontaneity, and talking the language in as high level as possible. And the thing is to adopt it to the level of comfort and challenge in which you are at the moment. We are really talking about what Chiksen Mihai is determining as the way of practicing a state of flow. Not too easy, not too challenging. And that's my job when, you know, we build, we, we continue to build up the level of complexities and challenges, how to move forward and to keep it, to, to make it more challenging, but not too much so, so that it, it's collapsing. That's wonderful. And now let's say a parent is about to start their child learning music. If we wanted to integrate composition and improvisation into their musical journey, and if they're starting fresh, what's the best way to, to start learning music? Good question. And I think that a statement that is hidden in your question is crucial, very, very important, which is that I think this is the right way to start introducing young people and not so young people, but, you know, who join the music later in life, by integrating, improvising, creating with learning music and performing written work. Coming back directly to your question, by trying to play by ear something that you know, you know, from childhood, something that is deeply engraved in your musical psyche, and by trying to do that through gestures and not to get each note right one by one. I think that's the wrong way about it. But by looking for a gesture with, you know, one or two wrong notes here and there to be accepted with a warm smile. <laughs> yeah, right. So you're in the UK and no doubt you're aware of ABRSM and Trinity. And probably right now, as we speak, thousands of children are practicing a Beethoven sonata for their graded exams. If you could perhaps talk to them as they, they're probably not thinking too much about improvisation, but if you could just give them a little idea or thought that may pique their interest into improvisation, especially with the piece that they're playing, uh, what would you say to them to may perhaps intrigue them about this music that they are memorizing very hard? Well, uh, the immediate answer is, of course, how you deal with repeats. But before that, I... I must say, I hope I'm not wrong, but I think that there is a change in recent years and both the ABRSM and the Trinity Guildhall set of exams begins to encourage presence of improvisation. In what exact form, I'm not sure, but I, I know that this is now a, a word you are allowed to pronounce out loud <laughs> uh, and even do. Uh, Coming back to how do you apply it when it comes to a piece, of course, when you repeat, uh, when you play a Mozart or Haydn or Beethoven sonata, except the late ones, uh, and you reach the end of the exposition, there is a double bar and you repeat. The idea of playing it same thing again as a copy-paste was completely unacceptable at the time. It, it, it was actually the way they distinguished between what we call professionals and amateurs, they call it connoisseur and amateur, you never repeat exactly the same thing so that your creative uh, touch is being put on the table. 
And that's the answer to your question, to, to encourage... Wow. Uh, actually, are there other things that we could be aware of? That's actually a pretty mind-blowing thing, that you're not supposed to just repeat it uh, exactly. Are there other things that uh, that culturally that have changed that would have been shocking to an audience 100, 200 years ago? Of course, of course. But you, you I think, word it in a very gentle and, and, and too polite way. You are supposed not to repeat. It's not that you're not supposed to... Uh, you are supposed to avoid the same thing twice. And if you play the same piece Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in a city, your concert is supposed, was expected to be different with the same piece, not only the way you repeat and re-embellish and re-develop, you know, uh, develop, but other elements are modulating preludes. If you play one piece in C major and the next one is in F minor, you would never go straight from C major to F minor. It's vulgar. You improvise an interlude that is paving the way and the soul of yourself and of your listeners, preparing them to move from where you ended the C major last movement to the opening of the next one in F minor. If you go from, you mentioned, we mentioned Sonat Facil Mozart in C major, imagine you said F minor, that you continue with the Appassionata. You never just boom jump into it. You 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 prepare the way by improvising a interlude, which is an improvising uh, sorry modulating prelude. You would often start a piece by a prelude of your own to to give the audience your you know way of of entering into this world, which is different from somebody else's way. You would take themes from the audience and improvise fantasy on them. In other words, to cut a long story short, the performer was a creator and someone executing notes of the text. And that is, that's a major, major difference of approach. I have two final questions for you. The first would be, if you're unable to enroll at the Guild Hall or you don't live in the UK, what books, resources, or communities or links can you recommend for someone who is interested in classical improvisation? Very good question. There is now, and that's thanks to the European project I mentioned, a website with many exercises, Impro-Metric, it's called, uh, or Metric Impro. I'm certainly not sure, but it's one of the two, Impro-Metric, I think, where sets of exercises in different genres of improvisation, classical improvisation, one of them are there, and there is a wealth of those. Uh, two other wonderful colleagues of mine, Karst Jong and Bert Moyman, are present in this website as well with wonderful exercises. Uh, as well as several exercises of, of different approaches to the art of improvisation. I'm happy to say that you can now, when you go through several music festivals and music uh, summer academies, uh, improvisation begins to be present. Robert Levin works, of course, uh, Myself, uh, you know, working with the Vienna Hochschule Summer Academy and, and the European Chimus Academy, ECMA. The colleagues I mentioned, Bert Moyman and Carl Jung, Yves Sandin. The, the, there are people who are beginning to work on the revival of it. It's a beginning, but we are there, I think. Fantastic. And the final question is, if you could reform music education around the world, what would you do? Wow. You know, I think that there is a wonderful work done in many, and I'm traveling a bit around, so I, I, I say, I'm saying that not as a politically correct statement, but as something I see. So I, I wouldn't take out anything, but add to it the element of improvisation, the element of taking down the fear of wrong notes, the competitions being associated often with an exercise where the first wrong note is your death sentence. <laughs> I think, I hope I'm not over-optimistic, begins to change as well. You know, Robert Levin is the president of the Bach competition in Leipzig. 
where the text that is the guideline for the competitors say that elaborated and embellished repeats are encouraged and welcome, which means that, uh, you know, please do improvise when you play the repeats. Answering your question, I would encourage more of that. And yes, well, you will not be surprised to hear that I think that classical improvisation should be a part of every first year undergraduate and postgraduate course, but not as a subject aside, as some, you know, nice to have fun time, but something that is linked to the repertoire people are working. Not not a separate business, but a part of the main business, as it used to be, which will bring us back to us performers to being creators. And that's that's what performers where up until I would say World War One when improvisation died. Well, the great Professor David Dolan, I mean, thank you so much for your fantastic work in this area. I think uh, you're really changing the culture and really helping young people get turned on to the idea that classical music really has a foundation of improvisation, a history of improvisation. And your stellar work is really contributing to that shift in culture. And I applaud you for that. And really, I hope you enjoyed the interview. Thank you for coming on. And I really hope we can, I can talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for listening to this interview. I'm so honored to be able to talk to all of my guests. They are the best in the business. If you enjoyed the show, I'd really appreciate if you shared it on social media and hit subscribe for future guests. Check out NikhilHogan.com for updates on my upcoming book, Why Children Quit Music, and check out SongbirdMusicAcademy.com for free resources on how to learn music. Thanks again, and I'll see you at the next show. 